All right. Okay. Okay, welcome everyone. Um, so today uh, we're continuing with the BQE seminar series. So BQE stands for Brooklyn Quant Experience. And as you know, this is a, a weekly seminar that we've had for many years. We usually have it at 6 p.m. on Thursday evenings, but uh, we've actually moved it, as you can see, to 9.30 a.m. to try and catch people from Europe, actually. So, um, so let me um, just um, introduce our speaker, uh, Ed Weinberger. So Ed began his post-PhD career as a researcher in theoretical evolutionary biology at the University of Pennsylvania and the Max Planck Institute, but he transferred his skills in applied math to quantitative finance when he became a quant on the interest rate desk at HSBC. Upon joining Deutsche Bank, Ed became interested in financial risk management, where he helped establish GARP's financial risk manager exam. Since then, he's since consulted on a number of projects in quantitative finance and financial technology, including his ongoing fintech work at Bank of America. Besides being a longtime adjunct in what is now Tandy's Department of Finance and Risk Engineering, Ed was a visiting professor of finance at Clark University from 2014 to 16. So Ed, I see you have your slides up. Thanks so much for joining us and take it away, please. Okay. Oh, so we should probably um, establish ground rules. Um, are you okay with taking questions during uh, the talk, or would you prefer they wait to the end? Um, well, yeah. I mean, sure. Why not? Uh, okay. You know, because I. Uh, yeah. Okay. Okay. Uh, so, everyone, if you if you have a question, just feel free to unmute and ask. Okay. Go ahead. Okay. I guess you can all hear me, right? Yes. We're hearing okay. You. Well, that's a good start. Okay, well, uh, all right, so uh, I'm Ed Weinberger, and as you heard, I was a researcher in theoretical evolutionary biology before I got involved with finance, and I became interested in uh, what I now call pragmatic information at the time, uh, because you're really interested when you're thinking about evolution is like, well, okay, you have the sense that the genome has information, but it's but in some sense, that information has meaning. And uh, that's what I want to talk about vis-a-vis -vis pragmatic information. And um, I formulated a theory that I first applied to uh, evolutionary biology. Uh, and then as I moved into finance, I started thinking about, well, OK, um, you know, this might have something to do with, uh, with finance as well. Um, and so I've, you know, come up with the ideas I'm going to be presenting here. Uh, I feel like there's an awful lot to say about this topic, and I feel like I'm really just scratching, scratching the surface. So uh, excuse me if that's the way it seems to you. Uh, but okay, hope the real purpose of the talk, I guess, is to share the ideas and to see whether we can, uh, I can influence some of you to think about them some more, and we can talk about them um, you know, at length when, if and when you would like to. Okay, so um, what I'd like to talk about is the need for such a theory uh, in finance um, and a twist on the standard mathematical theory of uh, communication that leads to this theory of pragmatic information that I'm, uh, that I'm mentioning. Uh, I'd like to say a few things about what I've observed so far uh, about pragmatic information, and then talk about how that leads to a quantitative definition of uh, market efficiency, and finally see what that has to say about the uh, price process that we know in uh, quantitative finance as GARCH, GARCH 1-1 in particular, the simplest GARCH model. Uh, and. Uh, like I say, see what it has to say about that. Okay. Um, to talk a little bit about what, what the, how this theory sort of fits in to uh, existing theories of, uh, of information theory. Um, information theory really got started uh, when uh, Claude Shannon wrote a long article in, uh, I think it was a Bell System Technical Journal, that was republished in book form with a long uh, introduction by Warren Weaver. And this Warren Weaver, by the way, is the same Warren Weaver whose name is on the uh, Quran Institute building. Um, anyway, in that introduction, he said, well, uh, 
there are three ways you can characterize a communication as being effective. The first is what he called the technical problem, which is simply uh, how accurately are the symbols encoding the communication transmitted? Uh, and that is what people ever since have been calling information theory, even though the title of their book was the mathematical theory of communication. Uh, other people since have realized that, well, okay, there's what Warren Weaver called the semantics problem, which is how precisely do transmitted symbols convey the desired meaning? Um, and he also noted that there's also an effectiveness problem, which is how effective is the received message in changing uh, conduct. Well, um, what I'm going to be talking about is pragmatic information addresses uh, problem C. And I think I would, I would argue that uh, effective, the effectiveness also determines, says something about the semantics, because the way you really know that semantics, uh, the really, the way you really know the semantics of a communication is by observing its change in behavior. This is why I define, well, I'm trying to define, there we go. This is why I define pragmatic information as the amount of information that is actually used in making a decision. Now, the reason why that's important in finance is because of the phrase price signals. But economists implicitly assume that there is information, infinite information transmit, transmission and unbounded rationality in, in processing these price signals. What I what I view this theory as affording is the opportunity to explicitly model uh, or at least to begin to model transit transmission and rationality limits. And that might help understand how equilibrium is achieved. Um, and ideally, uh, eventually we might be able to understand a bit better what's going on with bubbles and crashes. So pragmatic information um, at least my theory starts by treating the outcomes of the output of a channel in standard information theory um, as in, in the way that is transmitted, uh, that is treated in that theory. So let's have a look at that. The setup in uh, standard information theory is you have some sort of an input message sequence um, that I've written here just as a, a single random variable, but you might think about it as a sequence of letters, uh, you know, according to some uh, random process. And when I want to talk about these letters as uh, a vector, I use this boldface M. Anyway, the point is you have this input message sequence coming in here. Uh, you have some channel uh, over which the information, uh, the message is being transmitted. Uh, there may be noise in this channel, um, and it is received, and then from that, you get some output of the channel. And then the problem is to estimate what the original message sequence was given the output. And there are a variety of theorems about that. And there is a mathematical formalism associated with that, which is largely that which was laid out by Claude Shannon in this book I was talking about, The Mathematical Theory of Communication. And the most basic of these formulas is uh, the so-called entropy of the, uh, of, of the uh, vector m in this case which is the probability of observing a particular one times its logarithm um, and summed over all possibilities. Now, um, I will be using LG here as a way of indicating I'm not going to specify the base of logarithm because uh, 
uh, that doesn't really matter very much. Effectively, that's a choice of units. If I use log to the base two, then I'm talking about bits. Uh, very often people decide to use log to the base E and talk about nats. Uh, but in any case, it's uh, like I say, it's just a multiplicative uh, constant in front of everything. Um, from, this, from this basic formula, you can think about from the basic properties of random variables, uh, joint entropy, which would be the uh, entropy of two, two random variables. Um, and you can imagine this formula coming from that one simply because, well, okay, suppose this, this random variable has two components, okay. And then you can therefore think about uh, conditional entropy um, and, whoops, I'm sorry, I didn't mean to do that. And you would expect, and uh, you can show from the formulism that it is true, that the joint entropy um, would be the sum of the two individual entropies uh, if these two random variables are conditional, are uh, probabilistically independent. Now that, it turns out, takes some doing. Well, let's put it this way. Um, there aren't too many formulas like this that, um, that lead to this additivity of uh, independent, uh, independent random variables and have reasonable properties. Um, there are a certain number of uh, uniqueness theorems that say that basically this, this formula is unique uh, among all the, log all the logical candidates. Um, there's also another quantity um, that is quite relevant for us, which is called mutual information. And basically that's the amount of information that you learn about a random variable M if you know a random variable N and vice versa. And that is given by this formula here. Uh, and you can write this in terms of entropy in uh, these equivalent ways. Now you'll notice from this and the fact that um, all of these guys are non-negative that necessarily um, the mutual information uh, between M and N is bounded above by the entropy of either M or N and it's bounded below by zero. There's a little bit of uh, you know, mathematics you have to do to, to prove that it's greater than or equal to zero, but um, it's pretty straightforward. Um, okay. Another quantity that arises in the standard theory that I, I want to mention here is the entropy of a continuous random variable, where you simply replace the uh, discrete uh, probabilities by a continuous distribution and the sum by an integral um, over some suitable domain. Now this can be negative, so you have to be a little bit careful about what's going on here. Um, the integral exists if, uh, if this uh, distribution has a finite variance. Okay. Um, you know, in general, when, when you think about an integral, which may be over an infinite, uh, infinite interval, well, you have to think about whether it exists or not, and whether it goes to infinity. Okay. Um, now, standard information theory uh, observes that this quantity, well, there's also the corresponding quantity for um, um, mutual information. And it turns out that as you let the discretization go to zero, uh, discretization width uh, of the uh, of the uh, discrete distribution, as you, you let the discrete distribution go to a continuous distribution, you get a um, you get this integral, and you don't have to worry about uh, the discretization integral because whoops, because you. Um, Effectively, what happens is that these terms here cancel out. And again, even with uh, with this uh, with this differential form, 
this is strictly greater than zero unless uh, these random variables x and y are independent. A fun fact about uh, differential mutual information is that it's invariant if you uh, rescale x and y uh, with a one-to-one -one mapping. And this is helpful. I um, actually wound up trying to compute some of these things. And, um, and if x and or y has fat tails and is difficult to sample in, in a Monte Carlo, well, you can rescale everything to make the uh, distributions nicer. OK, so that's a little bit about uh, information theory as it is in the textbooks. Um, what about this idea of pragmatic information? Well, here you have the same uh, input message sequence, but you have a decision-making algorithm, possibly corrupted by noise, although we're not going to be talking about that so much in this lecture. Uh, and you have a the, effect, the effects of that decision that are felt uh, in some observed sequence of outcomes. And then you say, well, okay, the pragmatic information is the mutual information of messages and outcomes. And you write down this, the formulas that I showed you before. Um, and you see that basically, um, you could just replace that random variable n that I was talking about before with omega, and you have all the uh, you have all the formulas that you had before. Well, you might say, well, so what? Well, the interesting thing here is that if the input message has no effect on the output, then the output can be said to be pragmatically independent of the input, regardless of whether there's probabilistic independence nothing else, the decision algorithm can completely ignore the input. And that means, among other things, well, as we'll see in a minute, that uh, you can get different, different kinds of independence. Um, I'm talking about pragmatic independence. If you have, for example, two input messages, and um, In general, this will be true from the basic formulas of information theory. But if it turns out that um, the, uh, the pragmatic information calculation is such that this is true, then you have the, um, the formula that corresponds to probabilistic independence which would be pragmatic independence, but that's not this, but you don't need probabilistic independence for um, pragmatic independence. And I came up with an example of that, a very simple one, where you're only inputting for your random variable M, an input message that's either zero or one, and your random variable N input message is either 0, 1, or 2, and your output is either 0 or 1. Um, now, I haven't really told you anything about how this decision-making algorithm works, OK? So let's just say that the output is determined directly by n and indirectly by m. Okay, according to these probabilities. Well, I actually worked it all out here, and this is why I shared my whole screen, is that is, I have this spreadsheet, uh, which maybe you can see. And you work out all of the different uh, joint probabilities and you know, individual probabilities and so on and so forth. And what you discover is that it is indeed true that N and M in terms of pragmatic information are independent. Now, I know it's a little hard to see. Uh, 
but okay. I let's just go back here. Okay. So anyway, so that's uh, that's an example. So there's really something different about pragmatic information than regular inf uh, information. So having established that pragmatic information is a thing, well, does it do what you would expect it to do and what you might hope it would do? Um, does it really capture the idea of uh, the amount of information used in making a decision? Well, there are a variety of theorems that one might prove about it. One of them is what I'm calling the wrong code theorem. If you use the information to determine the compression of a uh, of the outputs, okay, um, the minimal compressed length of the output is the is the entropy of the output. In fact, that's that's the so-called um, noiseless coding theorem. Well, if you you can calculate that if you know the distribution of uh, probabilities of the output. If you know it a bit better, then you get the right code, which is why I called this the wrong code and the wrong code theorem. Um, because you have been given this extra information M, then you have the, the result that the expected difference in length of the two uh, compressed, uh, compressed sequences is, uh, has these bounds involving pragmatic information. So it is in this sense that pragmatic information really does capture the idea that um, that it is being used in making a decision. There's another, there's another way of thinking about it, which reminds me of the notion of free energy in statistical physics, where where you have free energy as the energy available to do work, which is the total energy, less uh, the amount of energy involved in uh, the internal configuration. So for example, you have uh, uh, water versus steam or uh, ice versus water, relevant on a st snowy day. Anyway, similarly, you have the idea of pragmatic information as the total amount of information, which is the entropy of the input message, less the amount of uncertainty that remains when I tell you the output, because you can have many different messages that would lead to the same output. Okay, so we have the notion of pragmatic information is a thing, and it's somewhat plausible that um, that it is what I said it is, which is the amount of information used in making a decision. But one of the things that's implicit. Ed, Ed is, uh, it, would it be convenient to ask you kind of a real fundamental question at this point? Sure. I would like to understand exactly what is information in this modeling. And I want to distinguish between a fact that one person might know, uh, but and the other person might not know but they both agree on what the fact means versus- Well, I'm defining versus, meaning as what they do with it. Yeah, well, my, my question kind of comes down to, if Jim Cramer tells me that GameStop is way underpriced, right. I may perfectly well understand what he's saying to me. There's no entropy in the communication channel and yet I choose to ignore it completely. Right. So now that defines this as what the information that we we both would agree that it's Im important in some sense, but well, but you see, that's the point. It's implicit in this is saying that since you're totally ignoring it, it's unimportant. It's not information to you. in your in your view. Well, it's not pragmatic it's, information. It's not, it's not pragmatic, pragmatic information. information. Yes, yeah. that's yeah, exactly okay. the point. 
Yeah. So, so such a big uh, the way of saying what goes it on the market and what goes on in the way we model markets. I'm sorry. What, to what a piece of information really is. I'm sorry. What did you say? I see this as a real big difference between what actually happens in markets where we might disagree about the meaning of a fact. We both both agree that this fact is what it is, but right. what it means is different. So is the fact the information or it, can we not separate out the information from our interpretation of the fact that may differ for different I reasons? guess my answer is the latter because you, know, you say, well, okay, we agree that it means something. Well, the only effective the reason why we might think it means something is because that influences our actions in some way. Does that answer yeah. your question? Yeah, I have a great, a good quote for you, Ben. So it's uh, from Heavy Side. He's uh, actually an engineer, right? He worked in this area. Right. I mean, yeah, he said something like, "The series diverges. Now we can do something." <laughs> so, so it was like, I mean, his the quote is famous because basically. Uh, you know, he was the only person who actually thought, you know, you can actually do something with this. Uh, so it changes his, <clears throat> let's say, you know, for him, the nature of this information, which is that a series diverges, is very different than for others, which is kind of what you're emphasizing. Yeah. People yeah. differ in terms of how yeah. they take it. That's right. How they behave. Yeah. Now, okay. Um, you know, I, and I sometimes ask myself, well, okay, is there any pragmatic information in what I'm doing here? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, right. and part of the reason for the talk thus, what so I just said the fact far, that we're debating it makes it correct. Like we're all receiving the exact same information, but some of us are saying this is useful. And others are saying, no, it's not. And that makes, you know, when you think about it, that makes it useful. Uh, right, because, right. Yeah. But anyway, I mean, the thing that I, decided to focus on, and the thing I think could be interesting from exploring this from a mathematical point of view, is the fact that, well, I haven't said much about the uh, computational process by, by which the decisions are arised, uh, arise. Well, as you probably know, there is this elaborate uh, theory of computation, in particular, this elaborate theory of automata, and uh, which, in all honesty, I don't know that much about, but I know enough to know that uh, quite a while ago, Noam Chomsky came up with uh, effectively uh, four qualitatively different kinds of compu uh, computational models. Um, the simplest is uh, a finite state machine, and I'm going to uh, refer to the next slide um, to talk about that. And the idea. The idea is that you have your input message sequence and internally this abstract machine is in some state. Uh, in this case, I've numbered the states one through six. And here we have, uh, uh, maybe we're in state one and we receive message number three. Well, we output uh, some output number two and um, and we now go to state four and await the next input. Similarly, we may be in state five uh, and we receive the same message number three, but we uh, this time we output output number six and we go, well, we go to the same state. Okay, but um, we receive a different message if we're in state five and we can go to a different state. Okay, that is the simplest of these uh, that's the simplest of these uh, computational models. Um, and I would argue this is what a lot of traders do. They look at a, uh, a finite uh, series of previous prices and based on that, they do something or, or decide not to trade. Um, that you could think of uh, there is a, an input process that these uh, finite state machines can handle, which are uh, discrete Markov, uh, Markov chains. Um, and there's a corresponding, um, there's corresponding sequence, sequences of symbols um, that are called grammars that they can handle. 
Um, and this, this grammar is actually not that much different than, uh, you know, things like handling wild cards in, uh, when you're playing around with Windows or, uh, or Linux. Um, a more sophisticated version of this would have, is the next kind of computational model. And that involves a so-called stack automaton, where in addition to this, you have what is effectively uh, a stack of papers, let's say, on a desk. And that stack could be arbitrarily high, but you have s some, um, some character sequence recorded on that particular uh, stack of papers, uh, a particular paper in that stack of papers. And based on that, in addition to these things, the decision is made. And of course, you can add more papers to the stack, uh, and there could be different symbols on the papers you add, in which case uh, these transitions will be different because there's different information on the stack. And you can push uh, more papers onto the stack, and you can pull more papers off the stack. And um, that, of course, implies there's an infinite memory. Um, that leads to the ability to process um, what's called a non-deterministic context, sorry about that, context-free grammar, um, where basically you're substituting uh, symbols independent of the context next to, uh, of the symbols next to the uh, symbol being replaced. You also have, uh, in the next more sophisticated computational model, um, a Turing machine that is bounded um, by the number of uh, cells that it can process. A Turing machine is basically one of these finite state automata uh, with a tape that can go forward back and forth of, uh, of a certain length um, and its symbols can be recorded and uh, replaced on that tape. If you restrict the length of that tape, you get the so-called linear bounded uh, Turing machine. And that can lead to context sensitive grammars. And then of course you have a Turing machine with an unlimited tape that leads to uh, basically any computable process. Okay. Um, now, a basic fact about the simplest of these uh, processes and the simplest of these machines, which is that if you have S states, um, then there's a, uh, a theorem in uh, automata theory called uh, yeah, the Myhill uh, Nero theorem that says that the message streams can only be uh, placed in S equivalence classes. And that right away bounds the pragmatic information, regardless of the, the inputs and the size of the inputs. Now that suggests more generally limits on the computational abilities that the, uh, of the receiver that places uh, limits on the pragmatic information and the more the decision-making algorithm is able to use the input information to restrict the values of omega, well, conditioning increases, uh, conditioning decreases entropy, uh, as you would expect. Um, the more conditions you place, effectively you're placing more conditions on omega that, that lowers the entropy and therefore that increases the pragmatic information. Um, but any computational ability that would uh, involve processing of the outputs necessarily would coarse grain the inputs and therefore, um, and therefore reduce the pragmatic information. An example of the kind of thing that can arise is let's suppose you're trying to process a two-step Markov process. You have two, um, you have two, uh, you have ones and zeros coming in and you say, well, okay, 
Um, given that I see two zeros in a row, I have some probability the next uh, next symbol is going to be a zero. Uh, similarly, if I see a zero and a one, the next probability is being a zero is, is given here. And if, if you specify these four quantities, well, uh, you can figure out what the corresponding thing, the probability of being a one, and you can work out all the all the probabilities you need to need to know about this process. Um, but one thing you can see immediately is that if you observe a zero zero, then a better prediction and a better decision uh, about what's going to happen next is to say, oh, and a zero is going to come next. But that requires uh, being able to process uh, the two previous states, which means you need uh, two squared or four, um, four states for your finite state automaton. If you have only a two state automaton, well, then you can only look at the previous symbol, which would be a zero or a one. And you see that the better, the better decision is always to predict the one. See here, the better decision was to predict zero if you saw a zero, zero, but it's always, sorry. It's always a better decision here to predict a one, but uh, you have the exception. Here, there are no exceptions. Okay. So now comes the conjecture. If all the input messages of a given Chomsky class um, have equal probability and the decision algorithms of a higher Chomsky class will generate outputs, well, if all input messages of a given uh, Chomsky class have equal probability, then all decision algorithms of a higher Chomsky class will generate outputs with zero pragmatic information. In other words, the outputs will be pragmatically independent of the inputs. So, okay, with that conjecture, I now move on to the next uh, part of the talk, which is what does this have to do with market efficiency or lack thereof? Now, the way I fit this into uh, the pragmatic information paradigm is to say, well, okay, what is the decision-making algorithm here? And well, I view this as a two-step algorithm. Uh, input, you have inputs which are past prices. Uh, and of course, I'll you know, in reality, of course, you know, there's what Jim Cramer says and all sorts of other things, but I'm looking only at uh, past prices because I want to think about uh, the weak form of uh, market efficiency, which is looking only at prices. Um, and you have one or more traders deciding at what I'm going to call a time epoch n, because I don't need to be very specific about, uh, you know, whether it's continue, uh, well, there are these discrete decision points. They can either decide to, uh, to trade or not to trade. The next part of the decision-making process is what I call the market decision process, where you have past collective trading decisions and the output is the next price based on the interaction between the incoming orders and the previous state of the market. So you have this picture here where you have incoming prices here, previous prices here, and you have one or more traders well, thinking, and they place their bids and offers, and that creates the market, and out comes the next price. This leads to I'm, my proposal of a quantification of market inefficiency. A market is inefficient to the degree that its previous, uh, that its prices are pragmatically dependent on previous price history. And in particular, a market is, inef market is efficient if prices are pragmatically independent of price history. So, the best I've been able to do so far with all of this is some more conjectures, which is that um, the preponderance of trading activity is effectively the execution of a finite state machine. And 
it is the aggregation of many such finite state machines that leads to uh, price series that are effectively productions of a context sensitive language because each of these finite state machines gets uh, goes into effect if a particular price pattern is observed. The trader finite state machines cannot recognize the resulting uh, context sensitive language according to my, my conjecture. And therefore there is pragmatic independence uh, and market efficiency. Now, at this point, all I have to all I have is a conjecture about this. Um, but it's also occurred to me that I could look at a stylized market, which is uh, characterized by the familiar Garch process. Now, what's interesting about Garch is that it is a um, it is stationary, uh, and in fact, it's a martingale. Um, if these constants alpha and beta uh, are less strictly less than one, reminder that the uh, Garch is characterized by um, a, uh, prices are characterized by having uh, Garch statistics. If the returns, the one period returns from uh, of this process are random, but with a standard deviation that is dependent on previous prices according to this formula here, where you have the con a constant omega plus another constant alpha times the previous uh, square of the volatility, um, square of the, uh, the variance of, the, of this distribution and uh, times another constant times the squared return of the previous step. Okay, so this is a martingale. Um, prices are martingales, which, which means according to some definitions of uh, market uh, of uh, efficiency, uh, this would be an efficient market, but they are not independent of previous uh, returns and previous prices. Uh, and therefore, according to my definition, um, such a such a market would be uh, inefficient. Now, um, a couple of things to say. The first, and I have a clarifying question. So, I agree with everything on the slide, and your use of the word "not independent" in the second last line, like you you mean you know, so you're meaning there's no statistical dependence, and. Um, and so when you talk about um, your definition of efficiency and um, you require independence for efficiency, it's, it's, it's actually the, that independence is the statistical independence, right? Yes. Okay, it is, okay. Okay, so let's say more generally then, besides Garge 1-1, I mean, any of the Garges <laughs> would well, have well, actually, okay. All right, one of the things that I guess I didn't stress is that uh -huh. if you have statistical independence, then you also have pragmatic independence. Okay, so but, what's the distinction? I'm, I'm, I've lost the distinction between the two. Okay. Um, let's go way back here. You can have pragmatic, well, okay, the, the, the basic idea of, of uh, If it turns out that if it turns out that this quantity, if if the outputs are independent of the inputs, if the outputs are statistically independent of the inputs, then then this mutual information is going to be zero. Okay. Okay. But it could happen that the outputs will be statistically will be pragmatically independent. Of the of the inputs because the decision algorithm chooses to ignore the input. Yeah, can we say it's similar to the word correlation? So if independent, then there's zero correlation, but not conversely. So and likewise, yeah. if statistically independent, yes. then there's zero pragmatic information 
yes. or zero, um, whatever, pragmatic. Uh, I'm not, I don't know the word, but you know, like correlation. And yeah, um, you, okay. yeah you're yeah. So, so that analogy holds. Okay. Okay. Thanks. Okay. So all I'm doing is I'm just observing that. Whoops, this garbage. Yeah. So I think I can say it now. If if independent, there's zero pragmatic dependence, <laughs> right? Um, but if there's zero pragmatic dependence, it doesn't necessarily mean statistically independent. Is is that true? That's exactly the point. Okay. Thanks. Okay. Anyway, so what I had hoped to do, but I never quite was able to do for this uh, in time for the talk, was to actually calculate for reasonable um, for reasonable choices of uh, the Garch parameters what these numbers actually are. Um, it's a bit tricky because, of course, you wind up having to sort of do some sort of Monte Carlo estimate. And you have differences of, uh, you know, you're taking differences of two things, each of which are uh, computed to Monte Carlo. Anyway, uh, so that's work in progress. Anyway, in summary, uh, I've defined this quantity that I've called pragmatic information. Uh, I've observed that it's limited by the computational capacity of the receiver. And um, the degree of market efficiency uh, that you can measure the degree of market efficiency by looking at the pragmatic information of successive prices. Um, and it may be market inefficient, market efficiency may be due to traders' inability to detect patterns that are actually there. Um, and I also observe that uh, Garch markets are inefficient. Thank you. Okay. So you're defining efficiency as zero pragmatic dependence. Is that fair? Between zero pragmatic uh, dependence. That's correct. Yeah. Between um, between success prices. Prices. Yeah. Between current price, let's say, or well, it's actually returns. I'd say so. Between uh, a random return and past random returns. Right. Is that right? Yeah. Okay. <clears throat> Okay, and sorry, like um, the actual technical, if I, you know, so the actual equation for measuring the amount of pragmatic dependence, is it in your slides here? Well, it's you know, given by this formula. Okay. Um, so is it the IM? that it's, formula it's yeah. this yes okay so like the slide is saying it's greater than zero yeah um so what would zero pragmatic dependence how would that come in in this slide because well not. if this were zero okay then that would indicate that uh the market is efficient according to my definition okay thank you that answers the question okay Okay, yeah. So going back to your free energy analogy, which I quite like, um, you're saying that if there's um, no free energy, then um, markets are efficient. Um, no free, no free information or something like that. Uh, yeah, that all the information is being used in making the decision. So yeah, I guess that that is what I'm saying. Okay. Let me just hop in with the idea that a lot of people would consider if uh, price changes are uncorrelated, that that's efficient enough. They're, they would say that that market was uh, weak form efficient, even though volatility itself might be pr predictable. Right. Yeah. But if Agreed. volatility is predictable, then, then there's an option strategy you could profit from. I agree with you. I agree with you. No, no, Steve's right, though. I think, let me think a sec. Um, Oh yeah, 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 no, no. So, so sorry. Uh, there's something in between um, statistical independence and zero correlation, and it's called um, conditional independence. And let's say the usual notion of market efficiency relies on zero 
conditional independence. Is that clear? Conditional so, on what? Uh, you're conditioning on the information set to the, to the time. Yeah. Um, so like the filtration, let's say. So well, I mean that that would basically be this, right? You're conditioning on the information set. Um. Well. Yes, in you know, I agree that both notions, conditional independence and this, involve conditioning on an information set. But the actual definition of conditional independence is like broader than this. Like you may be isolate. Um, well, uh, I don't understand your talk well enough to be able to comment on um, the distinction between conditional independence that I know well and what you're doing. But um, you know. Um, All right. <laughs> so, but you should definitely look up, you know, this notion of conditional independence. Well, that's the whole business of filtrations and uh, uh, sigma algebras and things like that, right? Yes. And um, so, so um, there's another word for conditional independence. It's fair game. Okay. So those, you know, they're exactly well, the same. So if, well, you can have a, f a fair game is a martingale. Yes, exactly. So, right. so we agree, and uh, so that's yet another name. <laughs> okay, so, so, um, so when, um, so let's say using any of those three names, Martin Gale, Fair Game, or conditionally right. independent, like okay. I think you want to contrast um, that common concept. Well, to... that that's that's actually the point of the point that I'm making here, which is that um, the Garch process of Martin Gale. And by the way, of course, uh, I am assuming zero yeah. interest rates. The Garch process is a Mar uh, this Garch yeah, process is a martingale, but it's it's not conditionally independent. No, it is. So, um, so but it's not independent of the previous price. Yeah. So the language you, you may not know the exact mean, like. Yeah, maybe maybe I don't. Let's say it's yeah. So. Um, Hey, Kevin, I know you're on the call <laughs> and I know you're an expert on this distinction. Um, you want to jump in? That was Kevin Addison. Uh, I'm sorry, I, I, I don't quite follow what the discussion is. So the Garch is not, what, what was the discussion? Okay, um, so, so, so Garch is uh, a well-known discrete time stochastic process. And uh, let's say, and let's make it a martingale. Okay, and, um, like Ed is pointing out that the way that he's defined um, pragmatic dependence, um, there there is pragmatic dependence in Garch, and so this sort of brings out the distinction between pragmatic dependence and um, conditional independence uh, or dependence. Well, yeah, I guess yeah. my. That's the thing that I guess I'm confused about is that it seems to me that uh, because Garch is dependent on previous prices uh, and the pre, you know, and for any mm -hmm. process, the previous history of the process, then it's conditionally dependent. And if you think about it in terms of being a martingale, um, the expected increments of the process um, are zero, but um, there's m nevertheless, the process is dependent on, uh, well, the, pr the previous history of the process. True, all true. Um, <clears throat> slide back. Hey, Kevin, is the definition of two random variables being conditionally independent that um, the correlation between uh, one given the realization of the other, uh, um, using the, uh, um, I was going to say, like, doesn't conditional independence involve zero correlation conditioning on something? Is that true? No. Uh, no. I mean, it's conditional independence is very similar to the definition of independence. Okay. Uh, okay, so what is it? It's it, just that, uh, so the, you know, the probably the condition, uh, let's see. So 
would you say that the marginals factor, the, the joint factors, something like the standard definition of independent yeah, factor? Yeah, right. It's like P, so X, X and Y are conditionally independent given Z if P of X and Y given Z is equal to P of X given Z times P of Y given Z. Okay, good. Thank you. That's what I was looking for. Um, let me jump in with a, uh, a monkey wrench into this discussion. Um, when I'm computing the Garch forecast of next period's variance, all of the inputs are non-stochastic. These are realized uh, realizations of past uh, uh, prices, past right. returns. So we might say that today, tomorrow's uh, a Garch forecast is not independent of the Garch forecast for three months from now, but I don't see how it's meaningful to say that um, a, a forecast is independent or dependent on a set of constants, which is less. Well, but it's also dependent on previous realizations of a random variable. But by the, yeah, so that's what I'm saying. Looking forward, I can say that two future volatilities are going to be correlated with one another right. or independent. But to say that tomorrow's volatility is statistically related to a bunch of constants, I'm, I'm uneasy about that. Those constants can't be anything different from what they are as of date T. Well, well, I mean, well, here's a point. I mean, okay, well, um, what I want to say is, like, there's a theorem that says, you know, you cannot, um, you cannot have a positive expected profit. So expected means expected value. Um, if you're trading in a martingale. Okay, right, so if you're trading, right. for example, in a Garch process. Right. And right. so that's a useful theorem, right? Like, I mean, let's say, um, and, um, you know, use it, of course, you know, the trading strategy cannot look ahead, of course. So, so anyhow, um, so, so say, you know, so, so you've identified Garch is not pragmatically um, efficient, but that doesn't, you know, but since it's a martingale, it, it, there is no way we can make money trading in it. Okay. Uh, an expectation, in expectation. So, so, but is, so the question is, is there something I can do now uh, that I've learned that Garch is pragmatically inefficient? Right. Um, well, to, I seem to, I, you know, I remember you know, that there was a student exactly. in our department some years ago that um, for their capstone came up with an options trading strategy that utilized Garch that um, they showed make, made money. Yeah, so made and, money is vague. So I know, I know it, that in expectation they weren't making money. Uh, that I know. Um, right. But let's say, yeah, they could have got lucky. I mean, you're they right. I mean, the Martingale, had, you know, the Martingale theorem does. So tell you making that. money is vague. So you you're know, right. they could have had a very desirable um, P and L profile. It still has losses and still has zero mean. Okay, right. with a very positive skewness. Let's say right. that's that could be quote making money. Um, right. So. Yeah. So that's the question I'm asking, actually. So what measure, you know, what is the measure of, quote, making money that becomes available when uh, you have um, the pragmatic dependence? So I'm not expecting you to answer the question. It's just something. Right. About. But it's a, it's, it's a very good question, a very good point. Um, because You know, you're you're certainly right that if you're uh, trading with a martingale, uh, you know, you're not going to make any money on it. In expectation. In expectation. So, so, so the expected value of the PL yeah. is zero. That's true. Right. But you know, there's still that leaves lots of things. Just just you know, there's plenty of PL profiles with zero mean <laughs> that are actually extremely attractive. Okay. Yeah. Um, yeah. So so, but you know, I wanted to find attractive now, basically. Right. Okay. Um, yeah, I just I just want to say I think this is really fascinating ideas and I would love to see your slide. So I, I actually did a PhD in information theory at yeah. Penn and then I and then I worked on evolutionary biology at Penn after that. <laughs> you probably know Warren Ewens, I'm guessing he was the principal investigator on the grant that I was working up doing a postdoc under. Uh yeah, I think I sat in one of his classes. I was there uh nineteen eighty seven and nineteen eighty nine. 
Yeah, I was there. Well, my post, I, I did my PhD there from 88 through 95 and then a postdoc there in 95 through 97. Oh. Anyway, but uh, or how about David Searles and Chris Overton? I'm just curious if you ever. <laughs> no, I did a, my postdoc there at uh, with Stuart Cowell. <laughs> Yep, I I, uh, I went to the Santa Fe Institute one summer, so I, I know yeah. I, I didn't know Stuart Kaufman well, but I, I know yeah. who he is, and he was He's good friends with Warren Ewens, by the way. Anyway, yeah. Oh, yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm fascinated by these ideas. Would love to work on some of your conjectures. I wonder if you could uh, provide the slides. Yeah, they were actually sent out today. By oh, they were. Okay. Right. Uh, Although uh, I added one slide that I should I should tell you that I did add one slide. Oh, okay. It's <laughs> clear. Now, what I that actually leads me to a question, which is that. Uh, you know, usually you write a paper and then you uh, prepare a talk about it. I didn't do that. I haven't written this uh, paper. Yeah, yeah. That's and okay. I'm trying to figure out where I should where I should publish it. Hmm. Got to write it first. <laughs> you know, you know, like, let's just do that's that. right. Fair enough. Uh, yeah. Um, there isn't a journal that's like especially receptive to. Um, information theoretic ideas, though there should be. Um, well, there are plenty uh, of them. But, uh, what's that? There are plenty of them, but this particular. You know, oh, I mean, in finance. I meant for you know the okay. intersection of information theory and finance. Yeah, yeah. I mean the I, yeah. the IEEE transactions on information theory does have finance papers sometimes, but it's probably not the right place if you want yeah. to get. Okay, so you want to attract that, finance readers. Yeah. Yeah. So well, actually, Kevin gave me an idea. So there's something called SIAM Journal of Financial Math, and I feel like. They're fairly receptive to oh, okay. ideas in applied math, such as information yeah. theory, and um, so um, so maybe there. Okay, all right, we're um, kind of out of time, so I yeah. just want to you know thank you very much, Ed. This is a really interesting. Thank you. Talk. Thank you. And um, thanks for finishing on time and making okay. your slides available. Okay. So. Um, We'll um, continue next week. Uh, thank you all for attending. And, you know, I, I, I think I'm going to send up, because uh, I did add one slide, I'll send it, the final, okay. final version to Zaheer. Okay. okay, okay, so so there'll be an update on the slides you guys can expect later today. Okay, Okay. all right, thanks. Very good. Bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye. Bye.